Please join me in prayer. Holy Creator, journeying God, bring us a word today, and may your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. If you'd like to follow alone in your pew Bible, uh, that is page 860 in the pew Bibles. But now let us listen for a word from God. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. And moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did, when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. Now as they came near to the village to which they were going, he was about to walk ahead as if he was going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 41 years, huh? <laughs> Plus. I've had the privilege to be a part of that in one way or another for 34 years. And as both, you may know, both of our parents are, are retiring in the past two weeks, it's brought back a lot of nostalgia, a lot of memories. And oddly, one of the, the memories that has come up was one of our famous, uh, family's favorite pastimes in the early 2000s. We would choose a day between Christmas and New Year's to go see whichever of the three Lord of the Rings movie was being released that year. Now, many people debate what constitutes a Christmas movie these days. Die Hard, Batman Returns, or that Christmas classic, Gremlins. <laughs> I have no dog in that fight, but for me, 
the Lord of the Rings trilogy has forever been cemented in my memory as a Christmas movie. And this week I was pondering one of the greatest modern fantasy stories ever written, both as a family memory and as a tale of journeying. And of course, celebrating Jenny today, I pondered it in its relation to the journey of discipleship and pastoral ministry. Now granted, the life of full-time ministry uh, includes far fewer orcs, or encounters with giant spiders, or bow-slinging, axe-wielding elves and dwarves, despite how cool that would be. But it does include learning how to be a companion to others, how to wield power for the good of others without letting it lead you astray or consume you, learning how to heal in times of great wounding, and learning that humility and community are essential for the flourishing of the world. And as none of the main characters of the Lord of the Rings make it to the end without being shaped or changed in in some way by this journey, so too does the path of discipleship change and shape those who respond to the call. So here we are, two disciples traveling down a road away from Jerusalem on the outskirts in a town called Emmaus. We're dropping into the story here this morning. And not only are these two men on a journey to Emmaus, but they have been on a journey with Jesus. And it is one that has defied so many expectations. Enough to leave them bewildered and amazed and confused, empowered, asking all kinds of questions, and perhaps now in the days following Jesus' execution by the Roman state, very afraid. But again, unbeknownst to them, they find themselves in a situation that will defy their expectations again. They find themselves suddenly uh, accompanied by this stranger, this outsider, or what could be translated as foreigner, as they're walking. And they don't realize it is Jesus himself coming to them as the very kind of person he welcomed into the divine beloved community that he called the kingdom of God. It becomes this moment of suspense as we wonder, has this journey actually sunk in to the disciples' life, to their hearts? Will they act kindly and with hospitality toward this stranger? And as they enter into this conversation with Jesus, they recount their tale. Remembering Jesus as a prophet, mighty in word and deed before God and all people. And Jesus had this This power they had hoped for in a Messiah, and yet, Messiahs are not supposed to fail. So what are they now to do with their disappointment? We know familiar conversations when we have hopes of, that have been utterly dashed on the rocks. They come in many shapes and forms and sizes. When Maybe plans to start a family are put into question through infertility or the loss of a child, or when a community is rocked by an act of violence. Where does the journey lead now? We had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped he'd be the one to lead us into this glorious future of God's kingdom. Fast forward a little bit in the story, and Jesus goes on to walk them through the whole of the Hebrew prophets and writings. This is not bedtime story material. For some time on that dusty road with these two disciples, 
he walks through the story of Israel recounting the journey of God's people. From stories of promise to stories of collective trauma, to faithful and flawed leaders, to times of exile and times of return, to stories of extending boundaries and decisions to retrench Israel's communal identity. Jesus walks through all of this with his disciples to once again shed light on what he came to accomplish, to move the trajectory of God's people forward. It's a trajectory, again, that was different than what anyone was expecting. It pushed and stretched established social and religious, political and economic boundaries of the time that these disciples and and Jesus lived. It pushes and stretches those boundaries now, in our time. It led his disciples down a path that included a more expansive idea of what God's reign looks like and who it includes. And here, Jesus moves beyond just teaching about welcoming and loving the stranger to wrapping up his identity, God incarnate, in the stranger. Now, before setting off on his own for the night, these two disciples invite this stranger into their home around the table not yet knowing that by welcoming this stranger, again, this outsider, this foreigner, they've welcomed God. They've welcomed Christ in their midst. Around a table of hospitality, food, blessed, broken, given, strangers become friends and kin. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we're most often able to recognize the image of God, of Christ, in those strangers who most resemble us. Those whose culture or language or skin color, religious beliefs, ethnicity are recognizable for us in our experiences. We have to work a little bit harder to recognize it in those who are different from us. Now, we're probably all familiar with uh, Michelangelo's creation of Adam. It is part of the Sistine Chapel, his, one of his masterpieces. Many of us would recognize this painting uh, and be able to identify it with God's act of bringing forth humanity from the earth. And a rendering, a particular rendering, that many of us here can probably recognize a bit of ourselves in. Perhaps not as many of us would recognize Harmonia Rosales, a reimagining of this classic in her work, Creation of God. Rosales' depiction of God as a black woman, surrounded by a shroud resembling a womb, touching the earth-washed finger of a black woman, draws out our understanding of who we speak of when we say we are all created in the image of God. Until everyone is able to recognize something of themselves in the divine image we speak of, then we still have some work to do. And the loving purposes of Christ guide us in the journey of that work. The journey of strangers becoming kin of recognizing how the Spirit is already moving here and now, of outsiders being welcomed in, of how the Spirit moves in our lives, in our community, and our wider world. Of recognizing that Christ's love transfigures this world and shapes us. It burns in our hearts and our soul that we might dare to be compassionate people to tend to each other's pain and wounds, to speak truth to power, to beat swords and guns and bombs into plowshares, to be tender 
and to be strong. To practice humility and dare to defy anything. Anything that degrades our identity or anyone else's as a beloved child of God. And as a disciple on the journey, I'm still learning this. But the great thing is that we have companions to walk with us and people who set an example for us. Jenny. (laughs) Mom. Stay with me. (laughs) You have faithfully strived to be that disciple in your ministry. And I'll boldly speak for many here today, and those you've encountered on the journey throughout your years of pastoral ministry, that you have been a faithful companion and an example for so many people. And I'm sure there are certainly many people and experiences who have shaped you. And I know that there are people who have been part of your journey, whose understanding of the gospel has been shaped by Christ working in and through you. So for those of you who have been shaped by Jenny's ministry, today you have a chance to honor her. Yes, we'll go eat cake, snacks, share stories, hugs, gratitude, and please do, please join us in Spelman afterwards. But also, you have the opportunity to honor her by going and doing likewise. Whatever compassion she has shown, whatever listening ear she has offered, whatever presence of healing she has been, whatever inspiration for justice she has cultivated in you, go and do likewise. However, Christ's presence has been made known to you along your journey. However, you may encounter Christ in unexpected ways in the future, and you will. May joy burn in your heart and guide you toward a more loving embrace of the world. For that is where Jesus waits for us. Amen.